Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, early last month, we got our first look at Intel's new Outer Lake architecture. And with it, we also got our first chance to play around with DDR5 memory, which was also very exciting. Now, for the Core i9 12900K review, I did test both DDR4 and DDR5 memory in a range of applications and games. And I found for the most part that the faster, more expensive memory offered very little in the way of extra performance. And this was particularly true for gamers. That said, some games did show nice performance gains, but overall performance was much the same, leaving me to recommend that potential 12th gen owners ignore DDR5 for now and just stick with the tried and true DDR4. Of course, at the time prior to the release of the 12th gen series, I was yet to see what DDR5 pricing and availability looked like, and instead was forced to comment based on feedback I'd received from board partners and retailers. And all were saying that DDR5 availability would be poor and pricing would be extreme, and well, they were right. And at the time of making this video, major Australian PC parts retailer, PC Case Gear, has no DDR5 memory in stock, with the most affordable 32GB kit being some Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 5200CL40 memory, that's going for $560. So that's some pretty ordinary memory for that price. Then over in the US, the situation is really no different. Newegg, for example, has only DDR5 4800 16GB sticks in stock from ADATA, and you're looking at $330 US per module, again for CL40 memory. Meanwhile, the cheapest memory listed is a Corsair Vengeance DDR5 4800 CL4032GB 40, kit for $310 US. Then, the DDR5 6000 CL36 memory that I tested in my day one review and we'll be using again for this video, that costs $470 US for a 32 gigabyte kit, or you can order it locally here in Australia for an eye-watering $840, which I suppose is less than the $950 you can expect to pay for the 12900K. So, based on pricing alone, and the fact that even if you wanted to, you can't actually buy it, DDR5 makes very little sense for most users. But DDR5 supply is set to improve next year, and therefore so will pricing, so I wanted to take a more in-depth look at what DDR5 has to offer gamers when using an Elder Lake CPU. And this should help us determine at which point you should bother with the new memory technology. In order to do this, I've benchmarked 41 games at 1080p, 1440p and 4K using the Radeon RX 6900 XT. For the DDR4 memory, I'm using G-Skills Triton Z Neo 3600CL14 kit. And for the DDR5 memory, G-Skills Triton Z5 RGB 6000CL36 kit. The DDR4 memory was tested on the MSI Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4, and the DDR5 memory on the MSI Z690 Unify. Now, given that I've tested such a massive range of games, we won't go over the data for all of them individually, rather we'll look at around a dozen games, and then we'll get into a complete breakdown that looks at the margins in all games tested. So, let's get into it. Starting with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, we see a 13-15% to 15 performance improvement with the newer DDR5 memory, taking the average frame rate from 121fps at 1080p to 137fps. But more impressive than that was the 17% performance boost seen at 1440p when looking at the 1% lows, with a 12% boost to the average frame rate. As expected, the margins do close up at 4K, but even so, I was quite surprised to see a 9% boost to the 1% lows, and a 13% uplift for the average frame rate. So DDR5 is offering a clear performance advantage in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Now, a game that doesn't benefit from the use of DDR5 memory is Battlefield 2042, and although this data is based on our easier to execute bot match, the 128 player modes also don't see any improvement with the higher bandwidth DDR5 memory. So this one is a bust for the ultra expensive DDR5. Call of Duty Vanguard is another game where we find a negligible difference between the two memory types, even at 1080p. So it would seem as though this game isn't limited by memory bandwidth. Counter-Strike Global Offensive is a heavily CPU limited game, and here we see feeding the processor more bandwidth doesn't actually help improve performance at 1080p or 1440p, though we're only talking about a very minor single digit difference here. But it appears as though the lower latency memory is more important for this title. Interestingly, Far Cry 6 does benefit massively from the higher memory bandwidth that DDR5 offers, and this isn't because the VRAM buffer of the graphics card has been exceeded, as we are using a 16GB card. Rather, it just appears that this game dips into system memory quite heavily, 
And as a result, we're seeing up to 22% greater performance at 1440p when looking at the 1% lows, but even the average frame rate was boosted by 10% and then 13% at 1080p. The margins are neutralized at the GPU limited 4K resolution, but still some impressive gains at 1080p and 1440p in this title. Fortnite also saw some benefit to using DDR5 memory, though for the most part the margins were less impressive here. We did see a 12% boost to the 1% lows at 1080p, with a 6% improvement for the average frame rate, and this was reduced to 5% at 1440p and then nothing at 4K. Next up we have Halo Infinite, and I have played a bit further into this game, but sadly I can't get back to our demanding test included in our Halo Infinite GPU benchmark, so it looks like I'll have to start over again and play for a few hours to get back to that scene, which is really annoying. Anyway, for now we have this less demanding section of the game to test, and here DDR5 offered very little over DDR4, though I suspect this will also be true for the more demanding section that we tested previously. Performance in Hitman 3 also gained next to nothing when using DDR5 memory. We're seeing only a very minor increase at 1080p, with basically nothing at 1440p and 4K. For testing Microsoft Flight Simulator, I'm using the latest DirectX 12 version, and here we're again only seeing very mild performance gains. We're talking low single digit margins here, so certainly nothing to get excited about. Testing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds shows a small improvement to the 1% lows with DDR5. We're again talking about 5 to 7% here, so nothing to write home about. Meanwhile, the average frame rate remained much the same, so either memory technology will allow you to squeeze the most out of an Elder Lake CPU in this game. The Rift Breaker is a base building survival game with action RPG elements, and what makes it particularly useful for our testing is that it heavily utilizes the CPU. This CPU intensive game utilizes core heavy processors very well, and with thousands of units, it's a very heavy workload. Here we see that the higher bandwidth DDR5 memory has boosted performance at 1080p by 15%, and the same is even seen at 1440p when looking at the 1% lows. And even at 4K, we're seeing a small 6% boost to 1% lows with the newer memory technology. StarCraft 2 is another CPU intensive game, but for all the wrong reasons. Essentially, this old title only utilizes a single core heavily, but we see there is some benefit to feeding that core more bandwidth, as performance was boosted by 7% almost across the board. Finally, we'll take a look at the War Thunder results, and here we're seeing some pretty impressive performance gains at 1080p. Though how useful a 24% performance boost is when you're already over 200 FPS is hard to say. Still, even at 4K, we are looking at up to a 9% performance boost. Now in total, I did spend a few weeks testing 41 games, and we'll take a look at the side-by-side -side comparison across all of those games in a second, but if we look at an average graph calculated using the GeoMean, we see that on average the DDR5 memory offered just a 3% boost at 1080p, 2% at 1440p, and then a percent at 4K. So based on that, DDR5 does very little to aid the Core i9 12900K across a wide range of today's games. Okay, so here's a look at the individual margins for all 41 games, focusing on the 1% low results. So, as we just saw, overall DDR5 offers a 3% performance boost, but here we can see that the gains were as large as 20% seen in Far Cry 6 and Bright Memory. And other games to show strong performance gains included Watch Dogs Legion, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, The Rift Breaker, and Fortnite, for example. However, there were also games which ran slower, by a 5% margin or greater, such as Age of Empires, Hitman 2, The Division 2, Valorant, and Death Stranding. Moreover, of the 41 games tested, 26 of them saw no more than a 4% variation in performance, which is basically nothing. At that point, performance is basically identical. So, for over 60% of the games tested, performance was near enough to identical. It's also worth noting that for 75% of the games tested, DDR5 6000 memory failed to offer more than a 5% improvement. And for those of you wanting to see the average FPS data, here's a quick look at that. Uh, the data does move around a bit here compared to what we saw when looking at the 1% lows. For example, War Thunder is now showing the best results for DDR5 along with Doom Eternal. That said, overall we are looking at fairly similar performance trends. So, depending on the games you play, DDR5 memory can offer little to no performance gain, and really this is true for the most part. But the best examples are up around 20%, which is starting to get quite significant, and here we were comparing premium DDR4 3600 memory to premium DDR5 6000, 
with the DDR5 kit coming in at an almost 70% price premium. So based on that, DDR5 obviously isn't worth it right now, but we already knew that. It's now clear that pricing aside, for the most part, DDR5 has little to offer over DDR4 in today's games with an Elder Lake processor. That being the case, budget conscious shoppers should only consider DDR5 at a 10% maybe a 20% premium over DDR4 uh, when going for a flagship part like the Core i9-12900K. The value equation is considerably worse for DDR5 when comparing sweet spot memory like DDR4-3600CL16 for example. The G-Skill Ripjaws V-Series 32GB version can be had for just $135 US and that's for the 32GB capacity kit. Meanwhile, the cheapest DDR5 kit listed on UEG right now is Corsair's Vengeance for $310 US, and of course it is out of stock. So that is a 130% price premium when comparing with Sweet Spot DDR4 memory. As a side note, for the vast majority of games, you can still easily get away with just 16 gigabytes of memory, especially if you're a good lobster and keep your operating system clean. It's very easy to snap up a DDR4-3600CL16 16GB kit for well under $100 US. The Ripjaws V version, for example, is just $80. Finally, I might as well address the future-proofing argument since this came up a lot in our initial Elder Lake reviews. The basic argument is this. Invest in DDR5 now so you don't have to change your motherboard later if you want to upgrade to a 13th Gen Core series processor codenamed Raptor Lake. Firstly, Raptor Lake will support DDR4 memory, and while it's possible DDR5 will be of more benefit in a year's time, it's still not going to be massive, and really gamers will almost always end up being GPU limited in games rather than CPU limited. The big issue with the future-proof argument as I see it is the same with all future-proof arguments, and that is that they hinge on the investment paying off in the long run with very few short-term advantages. In the case of this argument, let's take a rather expensive mid-range motherboard such as the Gigabyte Aorus Elite AX. It's $270 for the DDR4 version or $290 for the DDR5 version. So already you're paying a 7.5% premium for the DDR5 motherboard. As explored earlier, a sensible 32GB DDR4-3600CL16 kit will cost you just $135 US. So that's $270 for the motherboard, $135 for the memory, and let's go crazy with the Core i9-12900K for $620 US. So that's a $1,025 US package. Now, if we were to go with the cheapest available DDR5 memory kit over at Newegg, which is Corsair's Vengeance DDR5-4800CL40 32GB kit for $310, Add that to the $290 Aorus Elite AX DDR5 with the Core i9-12900K, and you have a package cost of $1,240 US, so roughly a 20% premium overall. The problem is, I expect that that DDR5-4800CL40 kit will be slower than DDR4-3600CL16, so what's the point of paying a 20% premium for slower memory? But if we recalculate using the memory tested here, so the Triton Z RGB stuff, the DDR4-3600CL14 and DDR5-6000CL36, we do find a similar margin using the Core i9-12900K with the Aorus Elite AX. Basically, DDR5 ends up costing 20% more. Now, you could quite comfortably argue that a 20% premium is worth it, given that we're already seeing examples of 20% gains in games. But I'd also argue that you're just better off saving the money for a future upgrade because the DDR5 available right now is going to be pretty terrible when compared to DDR5 memory in a year or two. And we saw the same thing with DDR4 and then DDR3 before it. And it's also well worth keeping in mind that we're talking about 1080p gaming here with a 6900 XT. So if you've got a slightly slower GPU and you're playing at a more, let's say, reasonable resolution for such a product, then the difference in memory performance is going to be even less. In most cases, there will be no difference. Still, as I said in my day one review, you can make a reasonable case for DDR5 when paired with the Core i9-12900K, given that that is such an expensive CPU. But our advice for gamers really is to go with the much better value Core i7-12700KF, a CPU that we've also reviewed, and that thing is worth $395 US. And at that point, the DDR5 package is 25% more expensive, and then almost 30% more expensive if you were to go with the Core i5-12600K. Of course, the DDR5 memory in question is out of stock anyway, so your options really are limited to DDR4.
For budget conscious gamers looking to jump on Elder Lake with a Core i5 or i7 processor, my advice is to snap up an entry level Z690 motherboard such as the Gigabyte Z690UD DDR4 for $200 or the MSI Z690A Pro DDR4 for $220 and pair that with affordable DDR4 memory such as the Ripjaws V. Now, let's just hypothetically say, if Raptor Lake does end up being a huge step forward and worth upgrading to, in my opinion, I think you'd just be best off buying a new Z790 motherboard with DDR5 memory and selling the DDR4 gear that you have secondhand, as it will retain its value really well. Intel motherboards always do due to the heavy product segmentation. At that point, you should have access to a much better quality motherboard anyway, and a much higher quality DDR5 memory at a significantly better price. Also, the chances are that 12th gen series owners won't feel the need to upgrade until the 14th gen. So not the next gen, the gen after that. And I'd say that's at the absolute earliest. And at that point, you'd be up for a new motherboard anyway. So now that we've compared DDR4 and DDR5 memory across a massive range of games, the next step is to provide a detailed memory scaling video with the Elder Lake CPUs. And well, that is in the works right now. And hopefully I'll have that for you early next month. I'll be looking at a range of DDR4 and DDR5 memory to find the sweet spot. Obviously it's gonna be DDR4, but what sort of DDR4 should you be looking for when getting a 12th gen series processor in both games and applications? So that's something that video will answer and hopefully, yeah, not too long till we can get that one to you. And that is gonna do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, the like button, you can subscribe for more content. As I said, more memory related Elder Lake stuff is coming up in the not too distant future. So yeah, you wanna make sure you don't miss out on that. Also, if you'd like to support the channel and get some pretty cool perks in return, then you can join the Harbor and Box community over at Patreon or Floatplane. Links for those in the video description. Uh, Q and A's you'll get access to, behind the scenes content. Uh, we do a monthly live stream to myself get together and answer your questions there. And we have a really cool Discord server for Harbor and Box community members. So if you're interested in any of that, then check out the links in the video description. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.